I'm here with my former teacher and friend, Dr. Vern Poitras, whose latest book is called Truth, Theology, and Perspective. And it's an approach to understanding biblical doctrine. And the book uses truth as a perspective on all of the major doctrines uh, that we believe in as Christians. So I wanted to start with some basic questions, uh, get a sense of, of why you wrote the book, and then maybe lead into some of the really uh, fascinating pieces about truth uh, that you discuss. So we'll start with the question, why did you want to write this book? And maybe what change did you hope it would create when people read it? Right. Well, I guess there were two complementary concerns. One is just appreciating the unity of who God is and what his plan for world, the world and for salvation is. So, so that unity cuts across the classical divisions of topics in theology. Typically, we do systematic theology by discussing the doctrine of God, doctrine of man, doctrine of sin, doctrine of mm -hmm. redemption, doctrine of Christ. We have a whole bunch of topics, mm -hmm. which is practically the only way of doing it when you come down to it, because mm -hmm. you have to divide it up somehow. But in doing that, you could sometimes miss the fact that everything belongs together and that all these things mutually imply one another at a deep level. So that was part of my concern. And using one theme, truth, and go, running it all the way through the traditional topics is one way of saying, look, these are all unified around, well, this one theme, but then the one theme reflects who God is, God in his unity and God in his tripersonality in the, in the Trinity. So that was one purpose. And another purpose, I think, was to show that you could use a particular theme as a perspective on all the topics of mm -hmm. theology. And you smile, but I know you know that I've been an explorer of perspectives. So here is using truth as a perspective. Mm -hmm. But it was an example of what you, I think, could do with something else. I mean, I'll pick you out. You, you used the theme of giving, right? Yeah. And write, wrote a book on the book of giving yeah. that is really use, looking at God and his, our relationship to him in terms of that theme. Mm -hmm. Well, you could do it, I'm sure, in terms of the theme of life, for instance, or the mm -hmm. theme of holiness. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, the possibility of any number of books in my head. It probably won't be done, but I'm trying to encourage people, look, you know, you can, mm -hmm. you can explore the riches of who God is, starting with any one of his attributes. Hmm. Now, I, I think when people read a book, there are some people who will read uh, a book and put it back on their shelf, almost like a trophy, and they work through it. Um, seminary students are probably guilty of that. Uh, but when people read, uh, I know Kenneth Pike, uh, on his, his book on, on rhetoric, talked about rhetoric and, and reading and uh, writing as this endeavor to change people. Yeah. And so in that sense, when I read a book, personally, I think about how am I going to change as a result of reading this? I wondered if there's a sense in which you, you thought, well, if people can read this, what, what might they change? You know, what, what might be different for them after they read the book as opposed to before? Yeah, I hope it would be in appreciating God more deeply. Mm. I think that's a great need and a great, um, uh, a great uh, touch point for a Western world at this point because even for Christians, I think to some extent in practice, our doctrine of God has been hollowed out. Mm -hmm. That people think of God as coming alongside to help them psychologically. Well, he does do that, but that's only one aspect. And to understand who God is in his greatness and his majesty and his love is demonstrated in Christ. Those things are so important. So it's partly getting people out of themselves and into uh, appreciating the magnificence of God. Mm. Yeah, I think that would certainly be a good change for people. Now, people often think of truth as a concept or a standard, uh, but they don't perceive it as personal, and certainly uh, not as coming from the personal God of Scripture. 
So what are some of the implications of viewing truth in this way as personal? Yeah, I think it's actually important because we are afflicted in the Western world to some extent by the idea of the truth is just the facts that are mm -hmm. out there, independent of personal relations. But if God knows all truth, and if that's the foundation actually, and well, I believe that whatever that we know, we know because God has taught us, often through means, of course, but that's true even of unbelievers, mm -hmm. that though they're not acknowledging God, it's still a gift of God, whatever they know. But if that's true, and if it starts from God, then anything you know connects you with the God who is the source mm -hmm. of knowledge and the source of truth. And that's a challenge, I think, for us to integrate who we are as persons with the, this factuality realm, which is often treated as impersonal. Mm -hmm. But it's not, in, in the end, I'm saying it's not. It goes back to God who is mm -hmm. a personal God. And it goes even back to God who is tripersonal. So there's interactions in the mysterious way between the persons of the Trinity. And of course, in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. Mm -hmm. So God is truth, but then he manifests the truth to us. And that's preeminently in Christ in his incarnation. Mm -hmm. So really thinking of the truth personally also um, enables us to remember the central role that Christ has, rather than just saying, well, I'm learning here and there. Mm. But whatever you're learning, you're learning because of the grace of God, mm. uh, the, the, the benefits of God, which I don't deserve, which nobody deserves. Mm. And those benefits come to us because of the grace that is in Christ. I think that's even mm. true of unbelievers. It's not that they're saved. We distinguish common grace and special grace, right? Mm. So the special grace is the grace of salvation, which comes only to those who trust in Christ. The common grace, I do think, is still something that comes through Christ because we don't deserve it. Mm. And I wonder if for people today, uh, that can even be Christians, the sense of, of separating something like grace and truth mm -hmm. and not perceiving truth as grace. Um, do you feel like that's a common thing for, for Christians and non-Christians? I would imagine it's, it's more so for Yeah, well, you know, it's all about the forgetfulness, right? That we're continuously dependent on God. We say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. But if we really believe right, <laughs> that, that the bread comes from God or we go to the grocery store, well, that's a means God uses. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean that God is absent from the entire process of giving us our daily bread. Well, but, but truth is like that too. And I think, again, because of the secularization of science, science was originally started by, primarily by Christian believers who were seeking out the, the mysteries of how God ruled the world. Mm. So they saw it much more personally than we tend to today. But the modern scientist thinks, well, or the picture that we have is, right, just grind the crank and, and you come out with some new truths for us and some new gadgets and so on. Well, actually, there's a lot of creativity mm. that goes into that and a lot of commitment personally that I think is animated by the gift of God. Even, mm. if, even if the scientists themselves don't acknowledge God mm. and creativity, nobody knows where the new ideas come from. I think they come from God, rather right? the gift of God. Hmm. Uh, though they can be contaminated, right? Because we're living in a world of sin too. Hmm. So, so it's a bit, th there's that complexity of saying, I have to sort through. I can't hmm. just accept anything that anybody is giving me. But the other side of it is that God is continuously involved in the world. He makes his sun to shine upon the, the, the righteous and the wicked, mm -hmm. right? Well, we don't think in those terms, at least many people don't think in those terms, well, the sun is just there, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it's God mm -hmm. who is giving us that gift. So I think the personal emphasis is valuable all across every dimension of life, but certainly in the pursuit of truth, mm -hmm. that what I'm seeking is gifts from God and not just something, uh, a bag of marbles, mm -hmm. right, of just... Although the marbles are created by God too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the um, the idea that 
truth as a gift from God would then establish that when you receive that gift, you're receiving it in a relationship, mm-hmm. which I think uh, many people would not want to see truth that way. They would just want to see, well, I, I have the truth. Yeah. No one really needed to give it to me. And so there's a lack of, of gratitude or appreciation for, for the gift of truth. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. You write about how we were created for communion with the God of truth, and yet many people are at enmity with God. They don't want anything to do with Him. Now, what does that enmity do to these people in terms of their understanding and then application of the truth? Yeah, well, inevitably it corrupts it. If you think of truth as just abstract things or facts out there with no connection, with persons, then you think, I can get it, and I can get it with purity without connecting with a person. Mm. But if truth, the standard for truth is really God's mind. So anybody who has truth is connected with God's mind, except if you're in flight from him, then that's going to corrupt your understanding Mm. of the original of which your knowledge is a kind of copy. The ways in which it's corrupted, however, are maybe just as diverse as the number of persons in the world because they're, they're people who, who, for instance, the atheist are just saying, I can have truth without God. But that's already a mistake. It's already a misestimation of that. Or the pantheist are saying, it's all one. Everything is God. Well, there, it's basically you tend to mold meld everything together till it's on all one blob and you really can't distinguish one truth from another. So that's a kind of corruption of the truth as well. Mm-hmm. But I think maybe the biggest thing is simply that we lose the ability to praise God. We use the ability to be thankful and to, be, to realize that we are the recipients of wonderful things from God. And I see it in the scientific area because I have a scientific background. I think in these terms of there are so many beautiful and wonderful things in science and some of the latest discoveries and some of the ancient discoveries, Pythagoras theorem. For me, that's a beautiful thing. Mm. So that's an occasion to say, wow, isn't that wonderful? Shouldn't we praise God? But people become blasé Mm. after a while if they're not connected with the God and with the excitement Mm. of understanding, this is one example Mm. of the wonder of who God is. Mm. As you were talking, I was thinking also the the corruption, ultimate corruption, of course, would mean the switching of truth for falsehood. Yeah. And uh, a sense in which the, the truth, as you know, uh, we find later in the gospel, the truth is meant to lead to freedom. But for people who are running away from God, uh, the truth can can actually feel imprisoning, you know, for them, like it doesn't lead to freedom. Yeah, yeah. It, the uh, the com- the Ten Commandments, for example, can feel like an, a prison. I want to be free to do whatever mm-hmm. I want to do, not realizing God is saying these are directives for li- living a healthy life and a life in communion with Me. So it's a very different uh, attitude. That is engendered. One of the things, I forget whether it's in my book, but it, one of the things I develop sometimes is the idea of counterfeiting. Mm-hmm. Because Satan is a counterfeiter. He produces things that are half-truths. Mm-hmm. They have to be close enough to the truth so that they fake you out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And not the blatant lie that mm-hmm. is so obviously a lie, mm-hmm. but the half-truth. And uh, that's more deadly in some ways than something that is just completely false. So, mm-hmm. so that's an example, I think, of this kind of corruption, that you get something and yet it's distorted, becomes an idol. You know, family is a good thing. God gives us the gift of family. But is it, is it an idol? To some people it is, or money, mm-hmm. right? It's a good thing to use as a medium of exchange, but if it mm-hmm. takes over your life, then it corrupts you. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of kind of counterfeits and, uh, and uh, half-truths can be that same way. Hmm. Well, I want to move on to um, talk about something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned using truth as a perspective. Hmm. And 
you mentioned also the possibility of using life as a perspective. Yeah. Um, and then you also quoted John 14, 6, which of course uh, comes up in, in the book a few times. And Jesus is the truth, but he's also the life. So he's both of those things. And yet, I think that many people, you know, myself included, can miss the connection between truth and life and think of them as separate, um, separate things. And yet Jesus is, here, is claiming to be both of those things in his one person. Um, I wonder if you could explain that relationship of, of truth and life as it relates to Jesus, um, pay, possibly thinking about what might non-Christians be missing out on or what might Christians be missing out on if they separate truth and life? Right. Well, I think Jesus is saying both of those things. The way, well, and the third thing, I'm the way. <laughs> He's saying all three of those things in the context of how do we find the way back to God. And we, we don't find it by searching for it, by, but by God searching us out. Mm and Jesus coming to us and revealing himself to us. And then we're, we're ready to set our feet on the way, a path of obedience, a path of discipleship. And it's a path of increasing excitement in living. And it's a path of increasing knowledge of the truth. All mm -hmm. three of those are coming through the person of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But all three of those things, I believe, go back to the nature of God himself because Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. He's not only God come and become man for our salvation, but God who exists eternally. So he has the divine life of God himself forever and ever. And that's the life into which we connect. We don't ever become divine, but True life is life in communion with God. And similarly with the truth, God is the truth itself. And then we connect to that through the person of the Son who is the Word. I think there was a connection, a role for, for uh, the second person of the Trinity, for Jesus the Son, even before there was any sin in the world. And it was through the word that we had the way and the truth and the life. But now in the context of redemption, we need repair, we need restoration, mm -hmm. we need forgiveness, we need, you know, we need life instead of death, right? Mm -hmm. Which is due to the curse of sin. Mm -hmm. So in those contexts, Jesus' statement is more focused, but it's against the background of saying the, the, at the heart of, of human life is knowing God. And you're not going to know God except through Jesus Christ. Mm. Mm. Later in the book, you talk about truth and redemption. And since uh, many people don't immediately see the personal nature of truth, um, they might be tempted to think that salvation is really a matter of knowledge. They just have to get more facts. Uh, they have to find a doctrine or a body of doctrines and agree with those things. And if they agree with those things, for example, the Nicene Creed, if they, mm -hmm. agree, if they agree with the Nicene Creed, then they are, they are saved or they're redeemed and that's it. And yet redemption seems to call for something much deeper. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about that for a few minutes. Right, well, uh, the, the classically in the Reformation they talked about uh, notitia, knowing facts, a census agreeing that they were true, and fiducia. The fiducia is trust. Mm. And it's that one which, more than the other two, brings out the personal character of the relationship that Jesus mm. uh, tells us to have with him. We must trust in him. We must trust that he has brought us salvation and not we ourselves. Mm. There's something innate in sin where we want to save ourselves. We know there's something wrong. Most people do. Um, but we're going to pull, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We're going to find the truth, or we're going to find whatever it is. And it's that trust element which I think most challenges the self-sufficiency, which is 
part of, of being a sinner, of I want to be the center of my life. I want to rule my life. It's essentially, I want to be God. <laughs> that's, that's what Adam and Eve tried to do. And we've been trying to do it ever since. So the trust element, it draws us out, but in a sense, any encounter with the truth demands that kind of response if it's to be faithful mm. of saying, if I really know something is true, then I've got to be willing to act on it. Mm. So yeah, uh, what's a good example of that? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if, if I have a brother or sister who is caught in a serious sin, then I know that it's a sin. Yeah, but I'm not maybe willing to act on it by saying and confronting that person, because that's hard. <laughs> but really, if I love the person, and if I really see the implications of the truth as the truth that God has made known to me, if I want to be responsible to God and to the demands of that truth, and I'm going to say, I've also got to do something about it. So that involves the trust of saying and trust that God knows what he's doing and that, you know, this truth coheres with the entire rest of my life so that I can't escape by just saying, well, I can, I can ignore, you know, I can bury one thing because it's just too painful mm -hmm. to try to acknowledge it. So even there, I think we've got the same kind of thing, but the central issue when Jesus comes to earth is, do you think that I am who I say I am? Do you think that I'm the Messiah? Do you think I'm the Savior of the world? But not only as facts, but are you willing to trust me on that? Are you willing to give up your life hmm. for the sake of finding it in a relation with Jesus? Hmm. Makes me think of the rich young ruler Yeah, who was happy to admit which doctrine do I need to believe in. To, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then when Jesus told him, good, he believed all the things, now you have to sell your fortunes. Mm -hmm. And he was much less excited about that. Yeah, yeah. but Jesus said not only to, as you know, he said not only to, to, uh, to, to sell and give to the poor, but then come follow me. And I mm -hmm. think that, that is a central element, and Jesus knew enough about him to know that if he didn't give away those things, his following Jesus would not be real. Mm. Right? Because he, that, that was his idol. Yeah. That was his security. Right? Mm. So is our security in ourselves or in how much, we, mm. how much money we have or in our family relationships or whatever it is, or is our security in Christ who has loved us and who has died for us? Mm. And, you know, those are issues of truth in the end, but they're also issues of life. And that's, by using truth as a perspective, one of the things I wanted to do is to show you, you really can't keep these things separate. Yeah. I, I thought, as an ending thought, I, people these days seem to be so unwilling to trust uh, mm. another person, uh, what mm. they read on the web. Um, it's just very difficult for people to trust. And I think sometimes people can separate trust and truth and say, well, I'll find the truth. And, and then once I find the truth, then I will trust you, you know, what you're saying. And what struck me uh, as I was reading the book was it seems like throughout Scripture, God is calling us to do the opposite and saying, mm -hmm. trust me first and I will lead you to the truth. I'll help you see the truth. But I was realizing as I was reading the book how backwards that is in today's world, that people would think, I will validate my potential trust in you by the truth that I find, rather than saying, well, I'll trust you to lead me to the truth. Because yeah. there's, of course, there's danger in that. You know, you're, you're yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and for a person like that, the last thing back is still the attempt to have a security in myself. I'm going to be in control. I'm going to decide when and if mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to commit myself to some religious thing out there. Well, Jesus is not a religious thing out there, right? <laughs> Which is what we've been talking about. And to everybody, I want to say, look, read the Bible. I mean, the Bible is so accessible in, in almost every part of the world and so little read I think, and appreciate for saying, look, you want to know the God who is, 
read the Bible, especially the Gospels, find out about this Jesus, and in that reading, if you are at all willing to be open, you find that you're being challenged, right? That you can't keep at a distance and say, well, I'm going to you know, make up my mind about this because the person of Jesus comes right at you mm -hmm. <laughs> and is challenging you mm -hmm. and saying, what do you think? Who do you think I am? Mm -hmm. What do you think I'm doing? And how do you see this as relevant to your whole rest of your life, mm -hmm. right? And that's... That's a dangerous thing, but it's the Bible in, that's crafted by God to ex do exactly that, to pull us out of this protective web of, mm. of security in ourselves. Mm. But really, that isn't a good security. <laughs> None of us is worthy of that kind of trust. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, Dr. Poithers, thanks so much for, for being with us and talking about this book. Uh, Truth, Theology, and Perspective. If you haven't gotten a copy of it yet, you can get it on uh, wtsbooks.com and uh, read it worshipfully. Uh, read it with a, a heart ready to praise and, uh, and thank the Lord for the good things He's given us, including all the truth. So thank you mm -hmm. again. Okay, thanks, Pierce.